Well, I think it's a good time to start. Hope everyone can hear me. This is today's tutorial for Pro 3D dedicated to the Mars 2020 mission, specifically the Must Come Z team. I'm Gerhard Pa. I'm an Austrian. I'm a co eye of the Must Come Z instrument. And uh, I hand over instantly to Sanjay Gupta, who is one of our important collaborators from Imperial College, College London. He will give a brief introduction into what's going on today. Okay, thanks Gerhard. Uh, hi everyone from Mars Cam Z. So I'm a collaborator with Gerhard on Mars Cam Z. Um, and what we're doing today is basically uh, Rob Barnes, who's worked closely with uh, uh, Gerhard and uh, Viavis um, to develop this program, is basically run through a geological analysis using Pro 3D and what measurements we can make an annotation. So basically, as you've seen from if those of you who've attended uh, the introduction to Pro 3D that Thomas Ortner gave uh, a few weeks ago, Pro 3D is essentially a visualization uh, and annotation tool for which takes in a stereo imagery and converts it into 3D digital, what we call digital outcrop models of uh, geological outcrops uh, with Mars data sets and uh, there's huge power in this firstly just being able to look at the data at in different multiple viewpoints basically um, it's made a huge difference to your know, papers I've done with uh, mass cam uh, images from MSL um, and then actually being able to um, make measurements on geological objects, dimensions of outcrops, dimensions of specific objects, and then make quantitative measurements uh, of, of, of the geological features in the data set. Um, so what today Rob's going to do is basically run through, a it's basically a tutorial. Please uh, ask questions as you go through. So just unmute and ask questions if you don't understand something, we'll lead you through this. And then the best thing is that we'll make the data available. I, th I thought the data was already available on the Pro 3D site, but it isn't. But we'll make that available and you should go away and play. And probably in a couple of weeks time, or probably not a couple of weeks time, in a, in a bit, we'll, we'll hold a, a surgery session where, you, where Rob will be available and you can ask questions specifically. But the key thing is just to go and play with the data and use the, um, the uh, booklet that describes Pro3D that's available on the Pro3D website and, and the videos, et cetera, to help you with doing your uh, learning about the tool. Okay, I'll turn it over to Rob. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, so um, as Sanjeev mentioned, yeah, we'll just be going through uh, Kind of applying the tools that Tom went through in uh, his first demo the other week, and then <clears throat> Steve Bannum, who's uh, with us at Imperial College, some of you might know from MSL, uh, has been has gone off with some of this data and played around a bit a bit, and it's, uh, got quite a fair bit done on his own. So it's, there's some it's quite intuitive to a point, but there are a few little bits that uh, might need ironing out here and there. So so yeah, basically, I'll just be running through. Uh, the, the basics of a of geological interpretation workflow in Pro 3D. So it's, I'm sorry, I'm not moving. There we go. So it's kind of similar to principles that we've been using on uh, in terrestrial geology, wherein you'll be out in the field and you'll make a sketch, or you'll uh, kind of use this as a basis to collect your measurements and understand the outcrop and kind of classify. What you're seeing look at spatial relationships um and so on and people have been using this for a long time uh, this is an example from uh, a phd student imperial sanjus uh kartik sanguan who went up to uh, caspe in spain and mapped out these um amalgamated channel bodies and road cuttings and it's just it just really helps to divide the outcrop into its key elements and this then helps us to particularly with the quantitative data that we have in uh, 3D, Pro 3D. Uh, this really helps in uh, organizing our observations and then organizing um, the, the measurements that we collect and kind of making a nice, complete model at the end of it. So this is uh, some work from Steve Bannon that's um, in press at the moment or in review, I can't remember. Um, and this is, the same principle just applied to uh, the Murray Buttes on uh, the MSL Traverse from Sol 
14, 28. So it's basically just like the the initial phase of it is just delineating features that you can see. So Steve's delineated these kind of first order bounding surfaces in orange here. And then he's found second order um, set bounding cross uh, cross strata set bounding surfaces here in yellow. So he's used a slightly different symbology and then he's kind of just for the purpose of highlighting the details of the internal structure, he's just drawn these, outlined these laminations in this uh, finer white uh, line style. Um, so this is well, this is nice to show something, but we can, in Pro 3D, we can also use these uh, kind of same principles to collect the data. So this is some work uh, I've been doing on the shader outcrop from Sol, uh, between Sol's 305 to 325, roughly, on the MSL Traverse. This is made up of several OPCs, but it's basically the same. We've been using different line symbologies to delineate different uh, key uh, sedimentological units in the outcrop. And then we've been using those delineations to organize the measurements and kind of make a bit more sense of what we're seeing in the outcrop. And then uh, we've taken this into external software. So I've used uh, Orient by Frederick uh, Volmer, uh, where I've just put, take, extracted the dips and strikes, for example, in this one. And plotted them in uh, stereo nets here on the left and rose diagrams here on the right and uh, it just helps us make separate the things we want to see from the, the noise the natural outcrops so the basic uh, the overall high level workflow that we're using is uh, i mean it's kind of been explained by tom but that was a while ago so i'll just refresh it again so uh, the ProVip software developed at uh, Ioannian Research by Gerhard and his team uh, basically goes on to, it has a uh, technique of extracting mass cam or nav cam stereo image data from the PDS uh, archive and the associated spice kernels and then processes these together to make uh, spatially referenced and scaled using the spice kernels uh, ordered point clouds. Uh, which is what I'll show you an example of that in a second, the order point clouds we're using. Um, and then we open these order point clouds in Pro 3D, use it to render, navigate, so you can just use it to look around if you want, but we can also use it to merge OPCs from multiple uh, viewpoints or multiple uh, rover positions. This helps to sometimes use a, a reference frame like the NavCam data and uh, this helps us build a digital outcrop model and from that we can map the layer contacts quantify the geometries of the elements that we see and measure the overall dimensions incorporating the 3d information so a lot of the time if we're measuring stuff from photographs it, it doesn't always incorporate um, foreshortening and distortion and so on so this just enables, enables us to quickly and easily collect measurements from images um, and then there yeah, we'll just use it to map uh, erosion surfaces deposition surfaces identify sedimentary structures which we can then kind of quantitatively analyze um, in terms of their dimensions and the paleo flow directions which helps us build a really nice complete paleo environmental model when combined with uh, all the other observations from all the other instruments so I'll just give a quick uh, note on to the accuracy of the uh, the data sets that we're using before getting into the, the workflow that we use. So uh, we've just done a quick, just to show it, like uh, we've done this on a few pages before, but just to show um, how close we're getting to reliable results. Um, this is two examples of uh, DRT spots from uh, Sol 2663 and 2664 of the MSL Traverse. And we've just taken the width of these circular um, uh, areas where the dust has been removed from. And this is the, these are very close to the rover. So we've got very good agreement. So we've basically got 45 millimeters. In many cases, it was spot on 45 millimeters. And some, I think this one here, it was like, 44.7 millimeters, but uh, and we've got this one here that's more like 44. But it's uh, showing 
this, this scales nicely, basically. So we can trust it to that extent. Uh, we also have some work that uh, Matt Baum et al. did in uh, 2017, where they was looking at um, measuring these Aeolian bed forms to assess the traversability for the ExMars rover. So use their observations of the Raptor. So this was using uh, MER data, Opportunity Rover data. Um, so use the the rat tool, which was also four and a half centimeters, and they measured the wheel spacing, which um, we did for new was 1.06 meters. Uh, so you measured five rat holes in um, some uh, data and got a, a mean diameter of 48 millimeters, a standard deviation of three millimeters. So it's not 100% perfect. There's some measurement, but uh, user input error as well. Uh, and the wheel spacing uh, measurements he got was means of around 1.061 to 1.066 and standard deviations of four to seven millimeters so um it might not be perfect here and there but it's more than we need basically to crazy you know levels of detail in these data sets um gerhard feel free to chip in at any point um but this is just a graph showing the uh, decrease or the, the increase in error of the uh, pixel matching with distance from the camera system. So uh, you can see we've actually got the the, um, the numbers down here. So these are in millimeters. So for every two meters with mask cam Z, uh, you've got uh, this is at full zoom as well. I think so. You've got uh, two meters. You have a about a 0.3 millimeter error which goes up to about 30 millimeters at 20 meters so i believe it's a quadratic increase with distance um yeah how do you want to say anything no that's just correct it's it's just uh the quadratic behavior of any stereo uh reconstruction method which means that at close range we are much more accurate apparently yeah so it's just just worth bearing in mind there's, there's still uh what's that three centimeters expected error at 20 minutes is still um acceptable for certain for some things not for everything but uh it's good to know these things uh i'll get into this a little bit more later on but um it's just to it's just to be aware of, of the uh the thought processes so i'll just uh, after that i'll just run through um basically almost beginning to an end of a, a, an overall an average geological interpretation workflow so this is from um, a paper we published in 2018 in earth and space science Barnes et al 2018 for about pro 3d and it basically runs through this workflow with a few other examples from msl and MER. and uh, but in this in this demo we'll just be giving more detailed how to so pointing you to the right tools and also the software has been updated quite a lot since then so i'll basically be showing the first stage of outcrop, outcrop exploration and measurement and then uh, we'll be going into mapping characterization of boundaries and the rock types i'll be talking about the different strike tools that have been developed uh, how we measure stratigraphic thickness what kind of uh, things we need to do for the paleoflow analysis I'll touch on fracture analysis and cross-section construction. These are more future um, plans, but I'll, but we can basically do them at the moment. We're looking to make specific tools for those purposes. So for the first, I'll get into um, Pro 3D now. So the first phase is basically uh, just kind of walking about the outcrop. So I'll open the software. Uh, I've already got it open here. But you, if you want to open it, you basically you go into the folder, you downloaded it, you've unzipped it. Uh, you just need to find this pro3d.viewer.exe application file. Double click that. Now, I always put like a, a shortcut on my taskbar down there. Uh, but double clicking that opens the viewer. And this is the viewer here. So just uh, show you quickly this is uh, steve bannam's interpretation of the uh the data set that i'm showing you so this is from sol 
1275 is looking south. Uh, we have the, at the base, it's kind of smooth, heavily fractured um, rock where we see fine laminations. We can't see any grains um, and it looks like a mudstone. And above that, at this kind of quite clear boundary, we've got a uh, well bedded, non parallel bedded, uh, laminated, resistant to erosion and weathering relatively to the mudstone underneath uh, sandstone. So, and this is correlated with the Stimson formation that um, has been mapped out quite extensively on there. So, basically, I gave this panorama to Steve and asked him to just to do a, a simple two-dimensional panorama interpretation like the kind would, which will be done in operations for target planning and so on uh, and these basically as in the Murray Butte's example is just divided the key linear or, or con the key contacts into a kind of hierarchy so we've got the main boundary here in red between the two lithologies and then we've got a cross set bounding surfaces and here there's only one order identified at the moment so you just map those out in yellow, use a dashed line where he's unsure and a solid line where he's uh, sure. And then just highlighted the, um, the lamination geometries just to give an idea. Like a clear, you close your eyes and see it and you get this kind of thing. So it really highlights the geometry. I'll show it without the, um, this show it without the annotations on. So it just doesn't jump out at you as much. And it just really helps to have this kind of 2D interpretation done before you get into the 3D side of things. So we'll be basically transferring this or what we need to from this interpretation into the 3D data. And then we're using this interpretation as a, a, a reference frame for collecting measurements as needed. And so we're going to Pro 3D. So the first stage is importing your OPC. So this is all you have to do is just select the folder which contains the OPC, and then the software automatically looks for any OPC folders in there. Um, I'm just going to this is the folder itself. It contains the images and the patches that make up the, the, the data. I think this uh, format will be changed in time, but um, at the moment, you just select the folder you want, click select folder, and then that imports into, uh, into the viewer. So we can just navigate around that a little bit. I'll just show some quick adjustment things I'll do to, to that before we start. So we've got a properties table here, I've selected the stereo mosaic. Uh, you can see that it's just, we've got the highlight, the bounding boxes visualized and uh, we've got these patches visualized here. Um, so first of all, we can see we've got these kind of long triangles here. So the, the surface is the surface is made up of individual tessellated triangles here. Um, where the matching is not good or where there's occlusion, uh, they become very long and stretched and can be a bit distracting to look at. So I like to um, go to this triangle filter option. That's currently at 1000. So that's uh, all triangles smaller than a kilometer are visualized. If you had a triangle bigger than a kilometer on one length, of, like if it's longest length was larger than a kilometer, you wouldn't be able to see that. So I will just reduce that to 0.5 for now. That's okay. So that's, uh, there's no triangles larger than 50 centimeters visualized there, but it still could be better. So I'll just scroll down a little bit. It just removes some of the noise out of the, uh, the data. So it's just helps you think about it a bit more clearly. Um, I'm also currently using uh, quite a, a sufficiently powerful computer. So I'm going to put this uh, quality slider up. Uh, currently, left is high. I don't know if it's a state like this, but um, if you're if you don't have much compute and power, 
this basically affects the level of detail rendering. So uh, if I've got it out here, um, we're seeing kind of the, the lower levels of detail when we're zoomed out. And then you can eventually, it'll still go to the higher detail when you get in, but um, this just because the computer I've got can handle it, I'm gonna put it up to maximum. Um, so yeah, and I'll just put the fill mode back to fill. Um, we don't need to worry, the priority is useful when you've got more than one OPC in there. Uh, we'll deal with that in another, um, another situation, another time. Uh, just going this viewer config here, we've got the, the neoplane thing. You can use this as a, as a kind of slicing tool. So if you put it up, it basically cuts everything within five meters of the viewpoint. For this purpose, I'll put it down to zero. Uh, you can also set the um, import triangle size and the navigation sensitivity. So the navigation sensitivity is how much the viewer reacts to your mouse inputs. So um, you can do that with this slider here and left or right, or you can use page up and page down on the keyboard. Uh, so page up makes it more sensitive, page down makes it less sensitive. Um, these are all also quite self-explanatory. Transformation we don't need to worry about in the Mars uh, data. This is more for uh, terrestrial um, trials and stuff, stuff like that. Uh, the color adaptation, uh, self-explanatory. You, you can adjust the contrast, brightness, and gamma settings. You can also make it grayscale, um, and that just helps you highlight certain features and so on. And then you've got color settings and so on. So I'll get into the um, the annotation side of things now. So just uh, yeah. So we've got two. I'll just deselect the surface so I can see it a bit more clearly. So just the point we've got this uh, coordinate center over there, where you can specify the size of it. You can put it as a one meter axis. So this is the blue line is up, the up vector. Red line is the north vector, and the green line is east. Uh, you can change the size of those lines. Uh, this is, can be used for scale and so on, and you can move it around um, with control. So every, I'll, just point, I'll make a point now, every time, if you just want to move around the screen, it's just use the mouse on its own, or use the W, A, S, T keys on your keyboard. Or um, if you want to, uh, So yeah, you just uh, you can move around, like strafe, um, move the camera up and down and rotate it, just using the mouse. But if you want to interact with the surface, like draw a line or a point or um, any annotation, which I'll be getting into in a minute, uh, then you have to hold down the control key. Um, so I'll just show that, I'll move this coordinate system here with that. Uh, uh, control click and then you interact um so that you can you can also turn that on and off it's, I, I find it quite useful for just giving a, a nice quick and easy visualization of scale uh we've also got so we've got two visualization uh modes free fly is what i'm in at the moment i usually prefer to use um arc ball is if you see this pink point here i'll just move that so pick explore center, hold control. I want to rotate this model around this point here. So I'll just move that there. So art ball basically gives you a, a kind of a pivot point in the model and you can then rotate it around like that. And, uh, it's a matter of preference what you use. Uh, for me, this is good for some things like showing, if I want to get like a nice simple point, uh, 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 plan view of the outcrop use this so if I want to look at it from certain different angles that might not be so easy from the free fly I'll use this but generally I use free fly because it's more intuitive to uh, roam around the upper so on. So um, I'm just going to uh, initial annotations so we've got this drop down list here pick explore center I've showed uh, place coordinate system I've shown 
uh, and we've got draw annotation so that it's self-explanatory this is you select this mode and then this enables you to add annotations and line and point polyline features uh, pick annotation is a way of picking the annotation in the visualization screen as opposed to the annotations table here i'll show you that more in, in more detail later and pick surface is the same so you can select the surface hold control and uh, select surface in the viewer so this is really useful when you've got more than one opc visualized so we don't need to worry about that for now uh, so let's go into the draw annotation so we're just in this kind of uh, outcrop outcrop exploration phase at the moment so uh, we'd just be wanting to take this interpretation here and then it's kind of mapping out it's, it's up to you what you want to do uh, i usually start out by placing points on the surface with a label and then um and creating bookmarks if need be to show what's going on and show where things are and just to get an idea so it's quite useful just to spend a while just looking at things from different angles uh, just getting an idea of what the kind of topography of the scene is uh, and getting an idea of the data quality as well so you can see we have some matching artifacts cropping up here and there which uh, appear in kind of form of slight irregularities on the surface but there's still so we've got some here for example but, um but yeah it's just a nice simple initial assessment of the data so i'll start with the annotations uh, the key one of the key principles of this is it would be familiar to those of you who've used arcgis or illustrator or um, tools like that before um so we basically make groups to organize the measurements so this is helpful in making us um kind of visualize what we want at keep Keep, show what we want at one time on the screen so if we want to show these boundaries but not these boundaries it's really useful and it's also these the group names are exported with the data so this helps us organize the, the measurements that we've got so i just that uh, you can select the group make it active with this um circle here when it's active it's filled in white obviously show all idle Select all, please select all. Uh, I'll just make this uh, so 275 interpretation. And then I'll just start for now. Um, so this, but this, this group is where I'll put all the hierarchies. So I'll put my main boundaries, one group. I'll put my, uh, I'll just show you again. So I'll put the main boundary here in red. That'll be in one group because it'll be more than one line. I'll show you why in a minute. And um, the same with the cross set bounding surfaces. And also, if I want to highlight or not these laminations, it'd be the same. So I'd put everything in one group. I'd then put all the other measurements in individual groups. It's just, it, it, save, it saves time later on, basically. So I'll just call this one labels. So I'll be wanting to wander around at the beginning and um, say, so, yeah, all right, I've got some nice layer in there. I will then select uh, the point, and I think I want to make it quite clear. Big. So I've got the point. I've got it in draw annotation mode. I've got my labels group selected. And then I'll click in the window once, and then hold down Control, and then you've got your point here. You select it using this. So you can select it to highlight it in by clicking its name. But to select it to use it or modify it, uh, you select this cube icon to the left. So with this thing, oh, you can also change the size of it afterwards. Uh, in this thickness uh, column, you can change the color. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to do uh, text. So I'm going to add a label just to just as a, just to help. It's, it's useful for showing other people what you see in something. So you might want to be going around this and see a few features in it. And you might just want to label a few bits and then send it to your colleague. And then uh, it's just nice and easy to visualize. So, so just uh, so you, it shows like that we can make the text larger or smaller, maybe. 
Um, but it's just useful for giving a, an idea of what's where. You can do that several times. So there's a bone there. So there. And um, yeah, so and then there's a the select all. And select all. So there's the labels. Uh, you can also do bookmarks in the same way. Uh, it's quite self-explanatory. It's got the same principle. You add a group if you want to make it into groups and rename the group and make subgroups in it. So every time you add this plus, that adds the subgroup into that group there. Um, and you can keep adding as many groups as you want and name them what you like. This makes the bookmark of that. And then if we move over here, the bookmark takes us there. So you can it's just useful for showing showing someone around when you're not there basically uh another um thing we were doing this first stage of um interpretation is just get an idea of the outcrop dimensions um so the principles it's, it's all very simple basis for these measurements we're starting from a, similar to our, uh, our gis style so it starts with a point and then two points joined together as a line, more than two points joined together as a polyline. The line completes automatically on the second point. Polyline, you have to complete yourself by pressing enter. I'll show you that in a second. Same with the polygon. The D and S is the dip and strike, which is a polyline with a, an associated best fit plane. I'll explain that later as well. And the TT is a new tool, which hasn't, we haven't, we're in the process of testing at the moment, but this is a, a true thickness measurement tool, which incorporates dip and strike and line measurements. So I'll go into, I'll just give you a, an idea of this uh, initial stage of help assessing the outcrop. So we just want to know how big is that, how wide is that area? So I'll open that group there. What you'll see I did there, I'll put it in the wrong group. So it's, it's easy to forget what you're doing as you go along. So what I should have done there was create a new group and call that dimensions. Uh, I, I usually keep this dimensions group um, throughout as I'm working with it. And it's also useful for putting more miscellaneous dimension measurements. Like if you're writing something up and you just want to say this rock is 50 centimeters wide and 20 centimeters tall. That's kind of where I put those measurements. Um, so the first stage I'll do this uh, overall dimension, so across and along. Uh, but first of all, I want to, I could move that line from group to group with um, this, not that one, so I'll move that down. With this uh, move selection tool, I'm not going to, so I'm going to delete it this time. So you select it using the Q, get the red cross and it's gone. And then I'll make my dimensions group active. Go to draw annotation and do that again. So there we've got the line, select it. And then we go down to, so we've got the properties list here, which I showed you, it's basically the same, but uh, I might label that with the, 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 um, the length. Uh, but the key thing is the measurements um, list down here. So we've got uh, height, which is the vertical dis difference between the two points. The height delta is uh, the height difference between the lowest point and the highest point of the line. So in this case, they're the same, but if you had a, a more irregular line, it'd be a different value. Uh, average altitude. Uh, That'll be more useful later on. Length uh, is a point to point length, uh, which in this case is 4.9 meters. So that's 4.9 meters across. Uh, way length is the complete length. So if you had a polyline, it'd be the root length of that line. Bearing is the bearing of the line. So that's usually because I drew it from right, left to right. Uh, that'll be the bearing in that direction, which, oops, sorry which is roughly just 273 degrees uh, to the west. So that's west. Um, so these are all really useful. The bearing and the slope are very 
just handy things to, just for a line. You can quickly measure whatever you want that's linear and in a direction. Um, and then we've also got these vertical distance and horizontal distance um, options. So the vertical distances, as it's, they're self-explanatory, but they're just in, basically considering the, the footprint of a line in a vertical or horizontal plane. So it's quite useful for if you want to do some other trigonometry where there's no specific tool or measure something where you don't want the, the outcrop topography to cause too many errors and so on. So, um, so that line is 4.9 meters long. I'll just wait for that in there. Sorry, you, can, you, know, you can change it whenever you want as well. Um, let's draw another one. Yeah, no, we've got two lines there. You might want to do, you can do as many as you want, measure anything that uh, is significant in the image. Uh, it's, it really just helps you understand, it, get, it helps you put dimensions in into a uh, well, Comprehend the dimensions, I should say. That's 15.9 meters. And then, yeah, so we'll, we'll have this initial stage done where we're just looking around, getting our head around what we're seeing, getting our eye in, getting used to things, and looking at things in different positions. And yeah, basically just kind of planning out what you're going to do. Um, so we've got the labels and dimensions. So the next stage we'll go to, wait, wait one second. There is one other thing you can do with a line. I'll just quickly show you. Uh, so I've used a linear viewpoint there, which basically computes the shortest distance between the two points. Uh, if you wanna, I think Tom showed this briefly before, but um, you can do a sky viewpoint and you can do a, a view, sorry, a sky projection and a viewpoint projection. I'll show the sky projection now. So this is basically more of a, a profile. If you want to find a simple way to visualize the topography of the surface, this basically has two points at the beginning and the end, but then projects uh, more points between the line at the, the um, scale of the resolution of the surface, I believe. So, Wrong, but, um, and this basically just shows us what what the topography would look like in the two D slice. Um, you can also do viewpoint, which uh, if you, you want to kind of know what a you know, forty five degree dip in in uh, surface would look like on the surface, what kind of outcrop character? I don't know. There'd be some uses for it, but that basically projects uh, uh, draws a line in the plane that straight line in the plane that you're looking at but it slices it in a, a kind of intersects a surface in an angle parallel to the pitch that you're looking at and the, and the bearing. So we've got pitch bearing is relative to north, pitch is relative to horizontal, so zero is horizontal and we have these positions here. Uh, some work needs to be done on these um, on some of this absolute uh, location. Uh, aspect here but it's it's a really useful to have that to visualize as you're going along. So I'll just uh, turn those off. So this is this is why it's useful when you create groups because you can fill up as much as you want but then to declutter it and just show it or don't show it. So I, I before I move on as well uh, just a useful thing to know is that while you're using the software there's this console window running in the background. Um, that's just telling you what, what the software is doing, if it's thinking or not. Or if there's a point that you're picking that isn't picking, it'll tell you there. So it's, it's quite useful just to help you understand what the software is doing or if it, it shows you if it's crashed and stuff like that, which hopefully shouldn't happen. Okay. Um, next uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, any questions? Yeah. Rob moves on. Okay, carry on, Rob. Okay, nice one. All right, so I'll just show this. Uh, so we're going to phase two. 
So this is basically drawing, uh, the delineating the, the key boundaries that you can see and highlighting the, the geometries that are relevant to what you're showing or what you want to be using the data for. So again, refer to this. This is basically uh, this is the end of phase two. So this is the kind of thing we want to be getting on here. So we'll make a group with a main boundary, a group with the cross set bounding surfaces. There's that will only make one group because there's only one order identified in this image. Now make a group for the lamination outlines. And these all these labels here, if you wanted to put them in the 3D, you just use a point and, uh, or a bookmark, do it like that. Um, okay, so I'll just make a start on that. I won't draw the whole thing, but one I made earlier, but I'll show you the overall principle. So go on to draw annotation again, go to polyline. Uh, personally, I like to use linear. So I like a, a straight line to be between the points that I uh, select. That's a matter of preference, I think, but um, it's less restrictive than the sky projection and um, it just it just means you have to draw a bit more detail but i think it's more it, it works easier i think at the moment the viewpoint and sky and um, sky projections might be overloading software a little bit so uh, i kind of keep those sparingly where i need to see what the surface looks like along a certain line um okay so we'll do a polyline uh, we're, first of all we're going to draw the main boundary so I'm going a bit ahead of myself here. I'm going to make a new group. Uh, let's call it lift down. So call it what you want. But, uh, this is going to be the key main stratigraphic or lith lith sorry, lithological uh, boundary here. Uh, it's usually good to kind of quite important to plan out what you're going to do before you do it as much as you can. So you can still do some serendipitous things, but the more you can get an idea of what you're going to do prior to starting the, the annotation itself, the better. So you can, this makes it more easy to, easier to organize and understand what you're doing. So I'm going to do this main lithological boundary group, do the first order cross, sorry, cross set. Bounds surfaces, and then I'll make one lamination. So this is just drawing for the moment. Um, I won't, I won't bore you too much of it. So I'll just show you this first first stage. So if I want to be drawing the the main boundary, uh, I'll start by so keep it as a thickness is three and where I can see so at the moment we this there's we're kind of limited to color and weight for the symbologies um, we would like to kind of standardize this as like certain boundaries uncertain boundaries certain fractures have a certain symbology certain sedimentary structures have a certain symbology uh, but for the moment it's um, up to you um, so I'll just select this red, quite thick line here, um, and can basically see mudstone there. It's obscured in here, but there's mudstone there, and then here we've got this uh, finely laminated sandstone. So we basically you can put your finger on the boundary. So on the draw, that is a nice bold red line. So I'm going to hold down Control, but draw annotation. It's in linear. And I'll start drawing. And I usually try. So at the moment, I'm drawing that, but I've accidentally put that uh, point there. So instead of deleting it, we can just use the backspace uh, key, and that goes back at the point. Um, and then you just have to draw it again. If you want to uh, cancel it completely, press the escape key. 
Uh, don't think there's a redo option at the moment. Um, but I believe the others are working on that. Uh, so you just have to be careful what you're doing. Don't try and avoid drawing like really long lines that you have to that are a pain to edit in the end. Uh, I'll just do this in little chunks for now. So I get to here and uh, I'm suddenly less sure. So I might just put the boundary a little bit thinner or you might want to change the colour of it. It's up to you. But as long as it's it's just nice to show your faith in your interpretation. It makes it much more um, intuitive or instructive, I should say. But, um, so I'll just draw this thin line here because I'm just not sure what, quite where the boundary is. Um, and it's, it's probably good to get like a, an idea of are we going to do a, a certain line means plus or minus like the boundaries within a five meter, a five centimetre zone or whatever. It's probably wise to set up these kind of thresholds and standards uh, before you start working on it. So at the moment, I'm just going to show certain and uncertain with those. So I'll just draw that there, and then I'm starting to get a bit more certain. So I'll just start doing. I'll just do it quickly. All right, I won't do the whole thing. Um, and then just to, to just to simply oh, so I'll collapse our group there, I'll uncollapse that. So just to show. If I want to go to another group, I'll just select that group as active, same as you would in uh, Illustrator or something. I'll select a different colour. I might want a different line thickness, line weight, and then I'll just start drawing out those contacts. Uh, so yeah, then you just go through in the same way, making thinner. If you're not sure, pick the way you are sure. And you can just go around the whole thing. Same principle with the laminations. I might just do a one a line one thickness. I'll draw them in the same colour as uh, Steve's figure. Uh, click on the screen with the left button, then hold Control, left button, draw along. I don't think I mentioned you have to press Enter to finish the the, the, the annotation. So I won't. Um, for you by doing the whole thing. But there is a, a way we can import annotations from other scenes into this scene. So I got Steve to do that for me as well. So I've got uh, this pro3d.an file, so the annotation files. Um, I don't know, Steve. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is. Uh, I think, yeah, .am file, basically this kind of thing, but um, made in another viewer. So Steve did all this interpretation, did it in all these groups, and I can just open it up in here, and it keeps the same symbology, and so on. So just looking through my checklist here. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's just uh, your complete line interpretation there, or complete as it needs to be for now. It's just highlighted made the main uh, sedimentary structures, so we can then start to so then we can start to um, use these lines as a basis for measurement and organising our measurements afterwards. We've got some really nice cross stratification up here. Some troughs, it seems, where we've got maybe not there, but up here where we've got these layers dipping apparently to the right very subtly, and these layers dipping apparently to the left. I'll go into that in more detail shortly. Yeah, so then, and you might want to, uh, Steve's a sedimentologist, so he's just looked at the rocks, but uh, you might want to look at these amazing vein formations, as well, uh, vein structures as well, uh, map those out. The intersections and so on. So this is the stage where you're just drawing onto the surface. And that will lead us into the next stage, which is going to be uh, we, we want to. So one, we've got this 3D um, 
geometry here. So the next phase would be different strike collection. Uh, sorry, Rob, are there any questions for this initial um, annotation phase? No questions, so I think we right. can go on. Nice one. Okay, so again, for the different strike, there's a tool especially for it. Same principles, you can change the symbology, weight of the line. I'll try and put it quite thin so, so that you'll draw a line and you'll be able to see the line that you used. I don't want that to um, dominate the view, so I'll just make that a little. Um, I'll take the I don't, want, I don't want these two lines here. If I if I select this cube here and this one just just with the left mouse button, uh, that means I've selected both. I want to delete them both. So I'll, okay, I can only delete one at a time. You realize, but uh, you can delete whole groups. So if you want to, excuse me, if you want to delete a lot of measurements, select them all make a group active, select them again, move to that group, then delete that group. Uh, you'd probably be able to work that as you go along, it's just a way around that. Um, but yeah, I just want to delete that one there. So, nice and easy. So here we've got these, I'll just add another group into there. So I want to, at this stage, I want to know, we've got a very irregular, abrupt boundary here. I want to know is it dipping anywhere, is it dipping into the screen or out to the right or left or away from us or anywhere in between those um, main directions. So I'll just do um, basal sandstone um, dip and strike and then I'll select the dip and strike tool. Um, and so as I was saying we're not really seeing a planar feature here so this is going to be like a really rough overall this boundary dips roughly this direction, so this amount of degrees to that direction comes in. So, so this is just made up of points. So I'm holding control, drawing a point there, and another point there. And another. So you have to draw at least three points for this. And um, they have to be in a plane. I'll go onto some slides. I've got to outline this now, which I should have already shown you. So you basically draw more than three points and it should be along a planar contact. Um, if you if you've got a curved contact, um, then just draw the points along the, the planar section of that curved contact. Uh, then I want to press enter and then we've got our dip and strike plane that's very shallow dipping down to the dip and strike section there. So it's about three degrees dipping to the west. So basically horizontal. Um, and then we can do that. So that's for our boundaries. That gives us a nice idea of the geometrical relationships between the upper and lower unit. And um, then we can, we want to do the dip and strike on these individual um, contacts as well and on the lamination. So we don't want to get the basal surface dip and strike. We want to get the lamination to strike. We make separate groups for that, but um, I'll be going into that a little bit more later. Uh, so yeah, I'll just show you some slides on how we how we do this different strike side of things. So uh, this is one of the key measurements that we use in geology or in structural and sedimentary geology, where we want to measure the unique orientation of a rock layer. So the strike is the azimuth of an imaginary horizontal line along the layer surface. The dip is um, the amount that that deviates. It's basically 90 degrees from the strike and it's the amount that it deviates from horizontal. Um, and it's always 90 degrees from strike. Uh, so the, these two, so if we've got the, the strike and or the dip azimuth and the dip, or the strike and the dip, as long as you specify what quadrant uh, you want the dip direction to be in, if it's north, south, east, or west. Um, this is a unique 
descriptor of any of the, the orientation of a plane in, uh, in geology. So we just use the collect these to understand overall bedding relationships, and we also use them to analyse uh, smaller sedimentary structures and features. You can see. So <clears throat> the tool that uh, I'll get Tom to chip in at some point. Uh, so Tom. Ortner at the others has developed a tool that uses total least squares regression best fitting of a plane through uh, the points. So every time I was drawing a point on that surface, it was one of these points here, and then we fit a best fit plane through that. And the software can then calculate uh, the residuals normal to the line as opposed to the ordinary least squares regression technique where the Residuals are in the y-axis. Uh, so this this one on the left, the ordinary least squares regression technique, breaks down the high dips. Uh, this value uh, it doesn't matter about that. It's magnitude of a bit because the points are uh, normal to the best fit line. Uh, we can calculate uh, some errors. So there's there's also going to be errors on the surface. Um, but we can, as in A, where the surface is. So there's, there's some error in the spice kernels, but it's not enough to be done to millimeter precision. And B, uh, there's some distortion with distance, as I showed in the, uh, in the graph a few slides ago. Uh, so the main, but at the moment, we, for the dip and strike tools, we've got um, what's that, five main outputs for now. So we've got the, mean error which is the mean residual distance from the point to the plane uh, the minimum which is the minimum obviously maximum self-explanatory standard deviation of the error self-explanatory and then the sum of squares which is being used to for future development so there's this uh, technique from jones et al in their paper in 2017 where they um it's kind of uh, Tom, let me know if I'm missing anything here, by the way. So I think we're using principal component analysis, and then Tom's found some very nice ways to use that to fit the plane and then extract the information from it. Uh, but say if we, the key thing is the light, so at the moment, it's very user driven. So you have to draw your line, and you have to look at it, and you have to assess whether that's a fair representation of that plane or not. Uh, you can do that in some ways manually or visually by visual inspection and checking on what you see and I'll show you that with the, with the software in a second. But we can also do, there are also lines of uh, measurement, um, ways of collecting the measurements that aren't going to give you effective results. So uh, we've got in this example up here on the top right, uh, we've got one line where Basically, the length exceeds the depth. So the lambda one, uh, th this is these described by these axes here. So uh, the lambda three is the kind of the distance normal to the plane that the that the, er the residuals occupy. Uh, lambda one is the longest uh, distance covered by them, and lambda two is the intermediate distance. Um, we inter we're calling lambda two in this case the depth of the line. In this case, it's a this is a this is a bad measurement because lambda two is significantly smaller than lambda one. Ideally, we want um, lambda two to be close to or equal to lambda one, or to swap around with it. And we basically want as much curvature or topography on the dip and strike measurement line as we can get. Um, so, like I say, at the moment, this is user driven, but we are working with Tom and others at the others to make this more um, kind of repeatable between the users. So, make a so take this um, output lambda two value here, and then only accept the measurement if that lambda two is greater than the precision of the OPC surface. The issue we have with incorporating that into the software is that the OPC precision varies between data sets and with distance. So 
we're going to have to find some way of doing that. I think um, visualising the, the errors on the OPC surface will go some way to helping that now start to incorporate those values into the, the error. And now uh, we've also been talking about kind of traffic light system. So where, if, as you're drawing it, the line will be red while this uh, this um, condition is predominant. And then as you start to get a more acceptable depth to the measurement, you'll get a... So as you're, bas you're basically reducing the amount of possible planes that you can fit through the points that you're drawing. So when there's a, it's, you've hit a threshold that's defined by the precision of the OPC surface, your line will go like green or something, or, or it won't get chucked out. So we're still working together on the best ways to do it and how to do it. Um, Tom, do you have anything to add into that? Did I miss anything? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, if, no. if we look at the, the figure A, it's not necessarily a bad measurement. It really depends on how how high the resolution of the surface is. So I think it's really key yeah. to to have this uh, measure of surface precision. And there yeah. are also in in Jones et al. There are two other criterions which somehow depend on the on the third direction, like the the variance in in height. So this is yeah. also an interesting uh, criterion to look into. Yeah, so you just want to find, so sometimes, like Tom says, you might have, uh, if the lambda 3 is small enough on that top value there, then you could still uh, use it. So we need to, at the moment, I'm doing this by looking at the plane that's created and seeing how that intersects with the surface. And if it intersects in a way that corresponds with the contact on the surface, and it looks also like... Also, the, the sum, uh, I think the error is basically in direction of lambda three, so the sum of squares of error mm -hmm. is uh, tells you how, how the variation in this direction is. Nice one. So high sum of squares is high variation, low sum of squares is low variation, or yes, just, just added up and squared. So the, the yeah. what does it do? Yeah, it middles out the outliers a bit. Yeah. Okay. Nice one. So, uh, this is, by the way, this uh, I'm showing here is the, from the output, we can export the, the values from the software. I'll show you that now. Uh, let's move this window thing out of the way. Um, so we can export, yeah, so you can export your measurements as a, a dot and file which is what Steve did here and sent to me, or you can export as a CSV file. Um, I'll just quickly show you the CSV. Uh, this just this just exports. So I'm using a massive screen here. Here we go. Um, so this basically contains all the attributes of the of all the lines and at the moment it just exports those lines or points or different strike measurements or any measurements that you've made that are visual. Um, so we've got the, just an identifier, tells you what geometry it is, it tells you the projection you used, semantics, something to worry about later, and the colour, uh, so thickness. So you can use all these things to, if you want to say make the basal surfaces of your cross sets thicker than the laminations and or the, of your measurements, you can do that and then you can all get sort by thickness. So it's just, it's quite um, versatile and simple in the way, in order to be versatile. So you can organize your data according to whatever parameter that you want. So it's exported everything that could be exported got the dip if you've got a different strike measurement which that is not it'll give you a different strike for polyline as well so it automatically fits a plane but it just doesn't automatically visualize the polyline so I like, I like to use a different strike tool here so we basically we don't need this level of precision here you can deal with that yourself later so we've got the dip angle which is the magnitude of dip the as dip azimuth which is the azimuth of the direction of maximum dip and the strike azimuth, which is the azimuth of 
of a horizontal line on the surface. Uh, so we connect. So I basically, when I showed you that the image from Shayla, I basically organised all my measurements into relevant groups and then exported it, and then just plugged it into this Orient software, and it was already grouped by unit and so on. So it uh, saves a lot of time. You can collect hundreds of measurements in not very long if you want to. So let's show you a bit more on the different strike. So for example, on the, if we're wanting to do a more reliable ones, so I'll do, a, again, we want to do groups. I want to do cross set. Uh, Base or dips. So that's why I know how much the base of these cross lamination sets dips. Uh, so I'll go to the different strike that's selected there. I'll do a different color covering a different group. And then I'll find, so I want to do, so a bit too sensitive there, so I'll make it less sensitive. I'm using my right mouse button now to zoom in, I'm using the right mouse button and moving the mouse up. You want to do that with W, just holding W now. Uh, so yeah, and then now I'm using the left mouse button. And now I'm using the the wheel, I'm pressing the wheel in to keep the, the viewpoint in the same plane. Uh, so this is uh, basal set boundary, uh, this basal boundary of a cross set here that Steve has annotated. And I just want to draw at least three points along there. It doesn't matter if the line leaves, it deviates from the line you've drawn. So it, it, the measurement only takes the points that you've clicked into account. So you can do as many or as few as you want. You can cover that completely or I personally choose to use as few as possible that describes it fairly. So I've drawn those. I'm not sure if this would be a good measurement because I'm not sure if that's, yeah, it looks kind of plain now. Um, but yeah, no, that's okay. So it's not, as you can see, we've got the dip and strike plane here. It's almost intersecting with the, the surface where the line intersects it. Um, it's up to you. I mean, that's, that's probably a half a degree off. But if we want to be properly careful, we should delete that. So usually, uh, when I'm doing all these. Um, uh, analyses or interpretations or whatever. For every one dip and strike that I keep, I've probably drawn four or five, or I mean, it always changes, but um, it's not a case of just clicking and um, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you put uh, bad measurements in, you'll get a bad result. And that's that's pretty, pretty good. I mean, there's some irregularities on the surface, do another one up here, so we've got a really nice uh, depth in that line there. Let me know if you need me to move faster or anything. We've got this uh, base here, and I'm just drawing enough points to. I've done that bit out of the way there, so I press backspace to delete it. I want to draw enough points to cover the depth of the contact. Uh, if I look down on that, it's pretty good if I've got that. Basically, it's, kind of, it's, it's well tried. It's like a three point problem without the same, tri not using the same trigonometry. Uh, so there's that bit there. Uh, so it's pretty good. I'll keep that one. And yeah, then you just basically go through. So I won't do all of them. Um, but yeah, you just go through, measure all the. I I use it, the reason I would collect these measurements is to so I can fully understand the um, the dip direction of the uh, kind of the geometry of the cross bed. So I'll go into that in a separate section later on. Uh, so now we've got these dips, and we're seeing basically we've got a, a sub horizontal boundary here, and uh, although to these. This is coloured by the dip magnitude here. We can actually change that. So if we go down to dip and strike colour legend. Uh, at the moment, it's on a maximum of 
45 degrees, which is red, um, zero degrees, which is blue. You can change that ramp, or you can change the maximum minimum. So I don't think we're going to get very high, dip, high dips here. So I'll change that to 25 degrees, and I'll make uh, just keep the minimum as zero, not plus one. Uh, but these are still very shallow dips, so they're still blue. And that one is, yeah, it's four, three degrees to 063. So, yeah, so you can go around and collect all those for a while. But uh, at the moment, <clears throat> we mostly want to be, um, yeah, just getting a, an idea of the geometry because then we're going to go into measuring thicknesses next, and we want to know how much we can rely on apparent thicknesses or true thicknesses. So I'll move on to the next section. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be going through, I'll show you some more examples of the dip strike. Second. So, yeah, so at the moment, uh, so the next phase is using um, a, the line tool or the true thickness tool. I won't go into the true thickness tool now because it's it still needs uh, proper testing. But um, basically you use line tools to measure um, distance. You can measure point to point distance or you can measure the vertical distance if your uh, stratigraphic boundary is horizontal, which in this case fortunately it is. So um, I'll just show you that now. It's, it's another it's as simple as the same as the rest of it. So I, I, I want to deselect that. If I deselect all. Yeah, it's not quite work. So I'll select all and then deselect all. Right. You might have to do some fiddling around here and there. Uh, okay, so I want to know maximum outcropping thickness, uh, apparently, first. So now we've got the dips and strikes and we understand like the main dips and strikes. You probably you just get them on all the jump all the boundaries that you can, and as many as you can that are that are reliable. And then you can start to kind of have a, a frame or a reference frame for your uh, fitness measurements. Just the line basically for the moment. So, for example, we don't have the full mudstone exposed here, but uh, we've got the map we can make a minimum estimate of the thickness that we've got exposed here. So, it doesn't necessarily have to be in any particular direction because we're just literally calculating the vertical distance between the beginning and end points of the line. So, for example, there we have height or height delta of 1.25 or 1.3 meters. Um, so we've got up to 1.3 meters there. You can do as many as you want, make it as uh, and then I've got histograms and stuff like that if you like. Once you've exported it, you can take as many of those measurements as you like. Yeah, I might want to change the symbology or whatever. Is that you basically got your value here? So there's your your length, and we've got north with a 90 centimeter roughly thickness there. We we'll do the same here. So we know because we measured that boundary to be horizontal, we can more or less trust that. Excuse me. Sorry. We can more or less trust that. Uh, That a, ver a, parent, a vertical distance, even though it's apparent, will be kind of close to the true. Thickness. So I'll do from the boundary there to the uppermost point of the outcrop that I can see, and then read it up there. So we've got two meters there. No, I'll just keep doing that. And then this is just all your apparent thicknesses. Um, so that's that's all nice when you've got horizontal bedding. Uh, but it, so you can do this for the units themselves, and you can do this for the individual cross strata sets. Uh, so uh, 
digress briefly. So if we want to measure the, it's the same principle for the cross strike sets. Again, this is why we take the, the different strike measurements of the base so we know if we can, how much we can trust these simple vertical or not um, measurements. Um, and this, this thickness of these sets can go some way to helping us understand what kind of environment the rocks were uh, deposited in. So in this case, we can fairly comfortably trust fairly confidently trust the um, the measurements that we've got there and in the, these kind of absolute differences. But in the case where we've got a dip in strata, uh, we have to be a bit more careful. Um, so there's a tool that has been developed, a true thickness tool, uh, which is basically a line. So you draw the line, as I've done it in that uh, last view, between A and B, so from the bottom to the top. And then you input a, a dip value, which is in. So you're drawing your line. I won't. I won't show it because I don't. I don't know if it will work yet. But th this will be in the future. We're spending a lot of time getting this right. Uh, so you draw your line, and then you specify a dip angle for the line, which specifies the dip angle of that boundary. Then it uh, projects downwards to a point where. Tom, you can interrupt me if I'm not doing this clearly. So it projects downwards to where it can measure the thick or the distance normal to that dip angle between this line projected from A and point B, which is the upper part of the unit that you've mapped. So, and then this would be developed for variable thickness. So we'd be able to put two dip angles in to measure um, non uniform thickness uh, layers and so on. Uh, this is very close to being finished. Um, uh, it will be incredibly useful for understanding the thickness of uh, the true thickness, the true dimensions of these data. So we, we, this is one of the benefits of the 3D data. We're not just estimating that looks like it's dipping that way and that looks like it's about a meter. We can actually very quickly get these values. So, yeah, and this is the same principle for exporting. You just export it and then you look at the delta height values, not the thickness or the, or the distance, is that true? Um, you'll also want to do this on individual beds. It's just whatever, you, if you can see it and if you can draw a line between it, you can measure the distance between that line. Um, so I might want to know how thick that bed is there. It's the same deal, but in that, in that case, I might not want to use the. No, I do want to use the elevation. Uh, you can see the surface. There's a few artifacts in there from matching errors. So yeah, we'll use the vertical distance between that. It's probably going to be a little bit off, but not by much. That's about ten centimeters. And then you just do that for every bed or whatever you want to measure. You do it for every cross bed you want to measure. Um, if you can, if you can see individual laminations, um, this might be good with the true thickness tool. You might want to measure the, uh, the thickness of lamination. As you can see there, it's a little bit unreliable though because we've got quite a slope on that. So you just always check your measurements when you take them. Um, okay, so I'll go on to the next bit, which is. Sorry, can I yeah. interrupt with a question first? Yeah, yeah please. And just with all those line measurements you just made, um, sorry if I missed it, how do you ex export all those those lines? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll just let's do that now. So we go into this, uh, we've got this um, kind of main home button up here. And we've got there, we've got the surfaces that's importing data, scene, save scene, save as, open. Self-explanatory annotations import. So I imported these ones. Uh, I could clear everything if I wanted. Export as a an annotation or export as a CSV. So that's what you was interested in there. Yes. Uh, now um, this I, pre I press that and it exports everything that we can see. So what I might want to do is I, I don't want all these lines here. 
just a, a micro, it's a good opportunity to show you this. Yes, oh no, it might be that. Let's just hide all of those, go into the root folder there, hidden there. And I just want these apparent thickness lines, so visualize that. So now, hopefully, this, hopefully if it works, uh, I should just, just be able to export those annotations into a CSV file. Uh, and I'll go into the to that folder. Then we've got the test data CSV file. Open that in uh, spreadsheet software of your choosing. And then, yeah, so we've exported all the lines that are visible. Um, we don't need most of these, but the key measures that you have are here. So then you've basically got the height, height delta, the length. And, uh, like I say, if you wanted to simply organize them in a certain way, you've got one. So maybe I wanted to make that one. That, that's measuring something slightly different. So I made the line a bit thicker. So I could then organize by line thickness. So, so, uh, okay, so, uh, sorry. It looks like the, the bearing uh, is not exported. What is that? Uh, it does look like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good, well spotted. Yeah, it's, it's really useful to have the bearing exportable. So, Tom, if you could note that down. Yeah, it's noted already. Nice one. So, yeah, um, and always, as Tom uh, and his team are really good. Uh, if you've got an issue and you say what the problem is, they're really good at fixing it and getting out a new version. Um, we're been. also planning on a geo JSON import and export that's quite of high priority, I think, for as a next feature. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, um, as mentioned there, yeah, you wanna you wanna have all of these. If we can see it there, we want it exported basically. So yeah, you, uh, I've I've used the the bear and export before on previous videos. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, no yeah. problem. So you can organize, it's, it's, it's just kept down to these kind of basic elements so you can make what you want out of it, really. <clears throat> okay, uh, any more questions? No, thank you. Nice one. Okay, so, uh, let's go into the, so we've seen all these uh, cross strata in that, um, in that OPC that we've been going through. Uh, the, these are really important sedimentary structures. Uh, you might want to delineate some of the non, so you've got your, your basic assumption of geological bedding is going to be this planar and parallel, but in reality, you see the processes that were responsible for the deposition are often reflected in the style of the boundaries. So you might have sharp and irregular ones where there's been some topography or some. Uh, incision into the substrate as this material has been developed, uh, been deposited. Uh, might have nodules developing, gradational, I won't go for all of them. Uh, I don't know um, what the geological background of the people on this call are, but it's a really simple, uh, easy to follow book is this down here, Geological Field Techniques by Angela Cope. Um, 2010 so it goes through all these but it's basically the same as what i'm showing you here but without the 3d software um so we want to we've seen a lot of these kind of cross-cutting non-parallel structures and that's basically cross bedding so this is formed as a, a dune in this case a, in a desert is migrating the wind is going from right to left and this causes Material to be deposited down on this um, this face to the right here, and it basically leaves these as it migrates left to right. Um, leaves these kind of dipping. My heat coming on. Leaves these dipping strata, and we can get the different strike of those to tell us which direction the dunes migrating. As it migrates across. Um, 
it leaves these stacked cross sets, which is basically what we're seeing. In, we're seeing it in 3D. So you're seeing this looking absolutely normal to the transport direction, but when we see a rock in, in, uh, in outcrop, it's not always going to be uh, preserved in that way. So this is an example of so the the, the geometry of the dune this has quite a strong influence on how uh, the cross bedding will look. So in this case, we've got a uh, 3D dunes or sinuous dunes, so that, and the flow conditions describe whether it's going to be like play, uh, parallel style dunes or cuspate or curved three dimensional dunes. And the more three dimensional uh, we get, we see well developed trough cross bedding. If we see the face, face perpendicular to flow, if we see the face parallel to flow, it's more subplanar, discontinuous uh, cross bed sets. So there's an example of some in uh, the Torridonian in, San, in, in Scotland, which is a uh, neoproterozoic fluvial system up there. And we've got some amazing, quite thick uh, cross bed sets there. And this is in uh, Utah, the Morrison Formation. There's some really nice trough cross bed and it's really coarse gravelly sandstones here. Uh, so we see these on Earth all the time, but um, you've probably been aware you've seen them loads of times on Mars and uh, along the MSL Traverse so far and some along the Mer Traverse. Um, so basically, as you can see, we've got, we want to know the dip, we want to know the direction of these uh, surfaces here but we also know that that's modified by how it's moved along on the base so we want to know the different strike of the base as well so we collect all those bits of information and this uh, is how we've done it. we've done that here basically so I've gone through on the shaler data set that I showed earlier and measured the dip and strike of several an individual, one individual cross set that you can see outcropping. I've measured the dip and strike at a basal surface and got a mean vector for that, which is described by this red great circle here. And then I've got the dip and strike of the laminations, which are within that cross strata set, and then um, plotted those as in here. And then the mean vector is described by this black great circle. So as you can see, it's not just the case of uh, these cross strata are just on a flat surface dipping and traveling across it transversely or, or whatever. It's, uh, there's often more complicated um, things in it. So we've used this kind of relationship to analyze how the, in this case, and Shayla, uh, will be publishing a paper on this very soon. Uh, we can see that we're seeing dunes migrating kind of obliquely to the uh, strike line of the overall beds on which it forms. So we can see this kind of intersecting, um, this intersection here where we've got two, two layers dipping uh, in a way that's not simple. And we see that's quite consistent. So that's, uh, we see that's um, characteristic of a, uh, lateral accretion basically um, so this also um, it kind of reduces noise in the data so if we just take the dip and strike direct or the dip azimuth of these uh, laminations individually there's a lot of spread in the data I'll, I'll click up to the um, the diagram of it in a second but you see a lot of variation this way we've managed to kind of refine the observations and get a, a kind of a truer paleo migration direction so the We've looked at the intersection and then we've plotted a line of line normal to that intersection, which gives us the the true migration described by the geometries that we're seeing. And this we see a lot more agreement uh, in, in the outcome. So I'll just so it's basically if we don't do it like that, we get a very large spread to so, these are the cross lamination measurements. So we've got the, the pink, the yellow petals are the laminations themselves. You can see they're spread between, spread over like, like 150 degrees, kind of thing, bunched between 
this area here, which is about 80, 70, 80 degrees. So it's, it's, still, it's still similar to what we see, but uh, we saw a different, we, we managed to get a different paleo migration direction. And we uh, looked at it in more detail and more carefully. So, I'll just show you. I mean, that's basically again using a different strike tool. Um, it's done using, I won't load up the shader data. It's basically, I just did, I did what I showed you. I just made a group with, uh, per, I labeled each individual cross set, made a group for the boundaries, made a group for the laminations, and then took those into. I think it was a Stereonet by Rick Almondinger, which I use for that because that allows you to draw in your own um, Stereonet. So email me if you want any links to these tools. That Stereonet's really good and Orient's really good for um, simple analysis of directional data. So basically, these, the reconstruction of these cross beds would be we draw the basal surfaces, we draw the laminations, we measure the different strike on the basal surface, we measure the different strike on the laminations, we reconstruct those, and then we get uh, our measurements. And then you can, again, we can also do thickness measurements and so on. Um, I think that covers the, that. I mean, it's, it's, it's up to you. Again, as long as you can do anything using the, the draw annotations, the line, these elements, and the groups, as long as you can think of a way to kind of make a hierarchy, then uh, it's quite easy to use and uh, quite straightforward. Uh, so I'll quickly show how am I doing for time? I haven't got much left, but it's half six now. Yeah. We were for 90 minutes. Uh but it really depends on participants. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to ask for, for additional questions, if there are any. Yeah, so it's basically not much. I mean, I think I've kind of showed enough uh, to get on with there, uh, but I'll just show some extra bits you can do on the data. Um, before I load up anything more, uh, you can do in the same way that you can do your cross bed analysis, you can do a fracture analysis. Uh, it's, it's again using the lines. So um, I might want to set up a new group. Let's do that there. Uh, bones and fractures. And then I want to do vein outline. Oh, oh, I need to separate. I need to separate. So, and then, yeah, and then you want to do the outline. So you might want to draw. And again, just so we want to. Again, I'd use the image itself because um, the texture on I think the texture on these three D on these OPCs is using the, the left mask cam thirty four millimeter, so we don't have the the maximum resolution on these. So I'd be constantly referring to the same location on to the panorama. It's still quite far away, but uh, yeah, you could just. But you basically use the same hierarchy to describe what you see in here. So you can be mapping out your vein boundaries. Uh, you look at internal structure. Can you see fibers in there? Are they oriented in any particular direction or any consistent direction? Can you see how these fracture or vein walls have moved relative to each other? That tells us what the stresses were like when it formed. Uh, is there layering like was shown in Garden City? Do we see evidence for these multiple pulses? Uh, we look for cross cutting relationships. And basically, anything you can describe, you can make a line or 
point or a polyline feature to um, handle it. So you have to just organize it in the first place. I won't go into that too much in detail now. Um, if there's time, I'll load up um, the shaler thing I've been working on. So, uh, so yeah, every time you save a scene, um, you get this .pro 3D file and a dot .annotation file with it. And the thing you open in Pro 3D is the Pro 3D file. So I've done some work on multiple output, multiple open scenes in Shayla. It might take a while to load up. There's about, I don't know, 150 to 200 gigabytes of data in that. Um, but it visualizes very smoothly. Uh, so I'll just basically, um, we can also construct cross sections and create um, stratigraphic log diagrams to visualize thickness and thickness variations of individual units across the outcrop. Uh, so I've done this at Shayla. Not sure how well it's loading up there. Might take a while. I'll just close it. Um, so yeah, I wanted to draw, I've been doing this research at Shayla and I wanted to visualize the um, cross-sectional geometry of the, the layers. Um, and you can't see it, so you have to, you have to draw it. Just those familiar with geology will, have, will know very well about cross-sections, but um, basically it's just a really useful tool to help visualize simply what we're looking at. So I drew four cross-sections along this outcrop. Uh, yeah, so Drew, Drew is here. But it's basically at the moment, the methodology for that is I would draw one of those profile lines that I showed. Uh, so the line with the sky projection, and that will show the, the topography. Excuse me. And then I'll actually take individual lines along the topography and measure that along that line. So I know the bearing of that line, and then I'll measure the slope of individual segments of lines along that. It's quite time consuming. Uh, it took me about a day to get all these profiles drawn up. But quite time consuming, but not that bad either. Uh, but I believe there's uh, in progress a tool for automatic profile creation and um, exporting. So that would make that a lot easier. But basically, it's just a measure of, it's just showing that you can again use the points and lines and polygons polylines to do what you want with as long as you've got the relevant information which is usually the orientation and the length um, so I did that measured, mapped out the topography from the 3D, the 3D surface and then took a straight line point to point line measurement of the outcropping width of each unit that I was looking at and then took the dip at each boundary and the dip at each key contact that mapped and then projected those onto the um, onto the outcrop. So I've got these four cross sections here, and it's just uh, really helpful just to visualise some of the subtle features that we're looking at. So we can see thickness variations in here. Uh, we can see just how thick some of these cross beds are. So the cross beds are bound by uh, these black lines here. The red lines are the uh, main uh, yellow these yellow lines here. So they're kind of bound in. Erosional boundary surfaces within the outcrop. We can visualize thickness variations wherever we see them. And it's, it's basically gives us a really instructive tool for describing the outcrop. All right, live, it crashed. But I can show you where uh, this is basically the last slide. Um, so, and from that, from the cross sections. From the cross sections, I've drawn these dashed lines at the outcropping boundaries and um, basically used the same, just used this principle to measure the maximum minimum thicknesses. And then we can see how this uh, thickness varies along the outcrop. Thanks. Thanks, Rob.
so I think there's quite a lot of information in that and lots of stuff to do. Um, the key thing is just to get started and to play, to follow the handbook that's on the Pro, uh, Pro 3D page and um, watch the videos and come back to us with questions.